All right, for the final section of this chapter, we're going to look at properties of angles in a circle. And first we have to get uh, some vocabulary out of the way. So if you form an angle with the endpoints, uh, we'll call them endpoint A and endpoint B on the circle, and then the vertex of the angle being the center of the circle, so in this case angle AOB, we call that a central angle. So it's kind of logical since we're using the center of the circle, this is a central angle. And if we take three points on a circle, let's say A, B, and C, then we have angle ABC is called an inscribed angle. So that one is an inscribed angle. Now, the reason it's called an inscribed angle is because the three points there, the two endpoints and the vertex of the angle, form a triangle that is inscribed in the circle. <clears throat> and so <clears throat> you can imagine completing the triangle, and now you have uh, three interior angles. And each one of them is an inscribed angle. So really there are three inscribed angles there. But if we're referring to the angle ABC, uh, then we can say ABC is an inscribed angle. And in particular, ABC um, contains a particular arc. So the, the language around arcs gets a little bit confusing. But let's just take a look at this third diagram down here. So we have two points AB. Now, we can talk about arc AB, but there is an obvious ambiguity because there's basically two ways to go around the circle from A to B. There's the short way, and that is referred to as the minor arc AB. And then there's a long way around the circle, and that's referred to as the major arc AB. Now, if you don't specify major or minor, then it's assumed that you're referring to the minor arc AB. Just think of it as uh, if you had to travel from A to B on the circle, which would you choose? You would choose the more direct or, or shorter path, which would be the minor arc AB. And if we have an angle, whether it be a central angle or an inscribed angle that uses AB, the points AB, as the endpoints of the angle, the language here it gets even more confusing because they talk about the central and inscribed angles being subtended by the minor arc AB. Now, I find this gets a little bit confusing, and quite frankly, it's used inconsistently from place to place. And so I like to use a slightly more uh, informal or casual uh, phrase, which is just that the angles contain the arc AB, right? And you can also, if it helps you, you can draw the line segment. Um, you can draw the line segment AB and sometimes just using a dotted just to make sure that uh, you're not trying to get confusing here. So if you draw that dotted line segment, then you can say that the um, arc, or sorry, the, the angle, uh, either the inscribed or the central angle, contains the line segment AB or contains the arc AB. So you'll hear me use that language, contains the arc or contains the angle. And if I'm referring to the arc AB, it's always the minor arc or the shorter or smaller arc. Now, the main properties of angles in a circle that we want to explore are twofold. One is the properties of an inscribed angle that contain the same arc. So here I have a diagram and there are three inscribed angles all with the same endpoints in different vertices and what we'd like to do is establish some relationship since they all contain the same arc. And then secondly we're going to look at um, the relationship between a central angle and an inscribed angle that contain the same arc. Now, in most um, 
textbooks, they ask you to you know, draw a variety of these and then measure them. And you know, quite frankly, it's difficult to measure angles accurately with a protractor. And you'd have to draw a lot of these uh, angles to get any kind of relationship. So the best thing to do is to use some dynamic geometry software like GeoGebra. So here I've got a couple of uh, circles with, on the left, one inscribed angle. So angle CDE contains the arc CE. Um, and on the right I have uh, both a central and an inscribed angle, and they both contain the arc FG. Now let's just first take a look on the left. So if I don't move the endpoints C or E, but I do move the vertex D, I'm going to be essentially creating a totally different inscribed angle. But let's take a look at the measurement. Right now it's measuring just a tiny shade over 50 degrees. As I move D around, absolutely nothing happens to the angle measure. It stays at 50 degrees. I can get all the way right up to C, and I have a 50 degree angle there. And as I move it over here, it's a 50 degree angle. Now, if you move it beyond, think about what's happening there. So if you move it beyond, it's now containing uh, an angle, but it's containing the major arc. All right. So once this flips over to the other side, that angle measure does change. But notice that it doesn't change at all if I move it between points C and E. And not only that, there is a relationship there. So right now it's 230, over here it's 50, and uh, a little later on we can try to find out what the relationship is there. I'm going to move the endpoints to create a different angle here, just so that we're convinced that uh, this is going to stay the same. So right now I've got a, a much a smaller angle, 29 degrees. And once again, as I move D around, I'm creating all these different inscribed angles but the measurement of the angle is not changing at all. It's staying at 29 degrees. So this is a fundamental property of inscribed angles. Inscribed angles that contain a given minor arc, uh, or actually just contain a, a given arc, um, always are the same angle, right? There's an invariant angle there. Now, let's go over and take a look at the diagram on the right. Right now I have it set up so that the central angle is 70 degrees, and the inscribed angle there is 35 degrees. Now, that looks like a ratio of 2 to 1, but maybe that's just coincidence. Now, one thing we know, though, is if I move this around, it stays 35. That's just the property that we just explored. All right. So no matter how I draw this inscribed angle, it's staying the same. The question that I'm really interested in now, though, is if I change the central angle, am I going to maintain this 2 to 1 uh, ratio? So let's try that. Let's make the central angle bigger. We can make the central angle just over 100. The inscribed angle now is just over 50. So it seems to be uh, fairly consistent, 2 to 1. Let's make it smaller. We'll make the central angle just uh, over 30. So that's just, a, or at least it was there. It's a little over 30 now, 30.44. Half of 30.44 is 15.22, and exactly what the um, program is showing. So there is this really nice relationship and um, again it's not all that hard to show or to prove um, and we'll spend a little bit of time in class showing that proof. But the relationship that I want you to take away from this is that an inscribed angle is always half of a central angle or vice versa. The central angle is always twice the inscribed angle. Now let's go back and take a look at a little problem. So what if we have a diagram and uh, in this case we have a circle. I'll draw another circle over here. So, I've got a couple circles here. Let's take a look at an example on the left first. What if my endpoints are on opposite sides of the center? In other words, I have a central angle, and that central angle is a full 180 degrees. 
So the two radii are in line with one another, making a full diameter. But we can still think of it as a central angle. That means that my inscribed angle is going to be half of 90 degrees. But half of 90 degrees, sorry, half of 180 degrees is 90 degrees, which is a right triangle. And we also know that no matter how I draw this inscribed angle, it's going to stay the same, and so it's always going to be a right angle. So this is a very nice property that if you have an inscribed triangle in a half circle where the hypotenuse of that triangle is the diameter, you have to have a right triangle. All right, so we're going to see problems where we have uh, right triangles, and uh, a corollary of that is sort of goes the opposite way. If you draw a right triangle, in a circle, then the hypotenuse of that right triangle has to pass through the center of the circle. All right, and now let's finally take a look at a problem where we have to fill in some numbers here. So let's say we have an inscribed angle and a central angle, and they share the same arc, or they contain the same arc. And then let's have uh, another inscribed angle. So this is a fairly typical diagram, and it can be a little confusing to students because there, there's a lot going on, and they're not necessarily sure where to look. So let's say we have one angle labeled here, 40 degrees. And then what we'd really like to know is this central angle, we'll call it Y, and this inscribed angle, we'll call it X. So I would suggest the first thing you should do, and maybe in a different color, is look at the angle that's labeled 40 and decide, is it a central angle or an inscribed angle? Well, the vertex is on the circle, and the two endpoints are on the circle, so this is an inscribed angle, not a central angle. And then ask yourself, where is the arc or where is the line segment that it contains? And draw it in, and perhaps draw it dotted or draw it in a different color. So there it is, and I'll draw it in red, kind of dotted there. So once I have that, now I ask myself, are there any other inscribed angles that contain the same line segment? And there are, in fact, the one that I'm trying to find that's labeled X. So X has to be 40 degrees because we know that if we have an inscribed angle and you know, the one caveat is that, that inscribed angles, those two inscribed angles are on the same side of the line segment. Those two inscribed angles have to be the same uh, measurement, and they are therefore both 40 degrees. And then finally, I say to myself, all right, both of those inscribed angles contain that chord that I dotted in in red. Is there a central angle that contains the same chord? And there is, that's what I'm looking for, which is labeled Y. And what's the relationship between a central angle and an inscribed angle if they contain the same chord? Well, the central angle has to be double the inscribed angle. And so this value Y has to be 80 degrees. So I'll just say Y equals 80. So that's an 80 degree measure. So I'm able to figure out X is 40 and Y is 80. But I will warn you that it's sometimes a little tricky to spot that relationship because the angle 40 degrees that we were starting with is so far over onto one side or the other. So that's why it's helpful to have a few steps to always follow. Ask yourself what kind of angle it is. Ask yourself where is the arc or the chord that it contains. And then ask what other angles contain that same arc.